Awesome. Are we good? Are we good to get started, Steve? All set. Wonderful. Well, as everybody sort of is gradually tuning in, I, I want to uh, say thank you very much for joining us on our um, sort of quarterly uh, ACS Journal Club. My name is Eric Widener, Chris Clifto, um, and I are, off, are honored to be joined by um, three of the experts in this field. So today's topic is massive cuff repair. Um, I don't think I need to introduce these three, but I, I'm going to anyways. Um, these are three of the thought leaders in this field and um, people that uh, hopefully we're going to learn a lot about over the next hour or so. Um, so Pat Denarda, as many of you know, he's sort of been a pioneer in, in all things rotator cuff, particularly with regards to um, with regards to how to how to solve this this complex puzzle of massive cuff repair. Um, Anand Murthy, also one of the sort of four leaders and thought leaders in this this. Um, road to your field, um, different ways of, of, of fixing both small and, and massive and, um, and, and some of the solvage techniques in the Boston Miles Sun, um, you know, everything from uh, road to your all the way through the uh, tin transfers and various, various creative solvage techniques. So we were really honored to be joined by them. Um, and thank you all for joining. Uh, Chris, do you have anything you want, you want to say? Yeah. So uh, this is a lot of fun when you all ask questions and um, I know I see Dr. Durali's on here and he, he gave us the, um, the task of making this a little bit more challenging and really coming at the, the panelists here. So give us some tough questions that, that you all want to ask and we'll have some fun with it. Wonderful. Awesome. All right. So we're going to get started and we're going to try to stay about 15 minutes per article and keep everybody on time, keep this to an hour, but also learn a fair amount. So we're, if everybody will direct their attention to the articles that I sent out to the um, first article, we're going to talk about the rotator cuff healing index. So this kind of sets the stage, a retrospective study, 603 primary uh, rotator cuff repairs done um, with a, 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 a MRI done either um, at one year or beyond or a, a, a CT arthrogram. Um, in general, they found that the retear rate was 24%, um, and, and this did have some effect on the clinical outcomes. But one of the important contributions to this was their multivariate analysis. And if you look at it uh, from a table three, the 15-point scoring system that they created, age greater than 70, the AP size, uh, tear size, the degree of retraction, fatty infiltration in the infrastructure, grade two or more, bone mineral density um, at the level of osteoporosis or, or, or high levels of work activity. All these played into that scoring system with retraction being, um, being one of the most important, bad infiltration, the fristinatus have giving a grade of a three and then grade of a two with, with many of the other factors I just mentioned. And, and they found that if you had less than four points, you had a, a 6% retear rate, five to 10 points, a 55% retear rate and greater than 10 points, a 86% retear rate. And this is sort of a nice radiographic study on, on, on sort of introducing a lot of these important factors that we talk about with regards to repairable versus irreparable, or at least potentially repairable plus augmentation type of, uh, of, of rotator cuff tears. Um, and it kind of helps establish this, this algorithm. So um, Pat, or, or uh, Pat Denard, you, you've been one of those uh, people who, um, I, I know you like the study, or one of the ones who has really found some kind of unique ways to interpret this, these, the outcomes. Can you sort of expand upon my summary of this findings? How is this and this and other studies kind of incorporated and changed um, both how you view, evaluate who, who can heal and then, and then what you do, want, to, want to do about these people yeah. that you worries about healing? Yeah, I think you, you just distinguish it nicely at the end, right? This is talking about healing, not repairability. I think those are separate issues because you can repair a lot of tears and they're not going to heal. Um, obviously, long-term, we think we want to get healing to maximize function. What I like about this article is I think that really out of all the literature that I've seen, I think it really does the best job of breaking it down into a scoring system. George Morrell, for instance, did a scoring system out of Australia that's, although it's admirable, it's not really clinically useful. And I think this one actually breaks it down well. Um, the one thing, the one criticism I have about this paper is they lump um, a big category of patients. So what we tried to do in a separate paper that we published is we tried to look at the different levels. And if you look closely, after about a score of six, you really have a big drop. So once you hit seven points and you calculate their healing, it really drops from about, I believe, about 65% to about 35%. That's where the biggest gap is. Why is that? That's really, if you look at the scoring system, you know, you got four points for retraction and three points for fatty infiltration, right? So if you got a three centimeter retracted tear with infraspinatus fatty infiltration, you hit seven points. Now we know that that's where you have low healing, but this at least quantifies it a bit better. 
So if you do nothing else, just look at those two factors in this in this study, I think. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Anand, do you want to expand upon that? Um, what are the most important factors when you're when you're thinking about healing, when you're thinking about um, um, you know repairing these massive cuff tears and and um, and the potential? What are some of the most important ones in your mind? Yeah, I like to put them into uh, you know an algorithm. You know, especially when we're training, and you know, patients will always ask you doc, what's my chance of healing this? You know, what's my chance? And now we can give them some guidance. You know, if you're older, it's a revision, it's a large tear. We're going to say, hey, your chance of healing, this tendon may be low, but hey, you're still may do well functionally and symptomatically. But I think the only, the one thing the paper left out that I really like to look into, and I look in on my intake form always, or what comorbidities they have that may not be listed, you know, What's the host like? Hypercholesterolemia, diabetes, smoker. I think a lot of uh, studies recently have come out. We're doing one now on what's the effect of cortisone on your, your revision rate or your healing rate too. So I thought it was great to kind of systematically pull out what important points are and our trainees can have and, and our patients can have some idea. I think Eric too, just to piggyback on that, I think you know this is the start of a trend where you're going to see hopefully more and more predictive modeling, right? And hopefully this becomes automated where maybe the patient fills out a form um, when they come in, their MRI gets scanned and you know, boom, here's their chance of healing. And maybe even what can I do differently to alter that path, right, as we go forward? Yeah. We got a question from Dr. Duraldi, or is it more of a statement? Not sure. We always heard that 65 was the age of which cuff healing dropped off. Is 70 the new number? <laughs> How old's Javier? <laughs> it drops off after that. <laughs> I usually tell patients in that 60 to 65 range, at least from the WashU natural history studies, that it's going to drop off at that point. And then you add in all the other host issues, you know. Um, they're much healthier out in Oregon than they are in Baltimore. They don't smoke as much out there. <laughs> Dr. Duraldi has replied with that he is old as dirt. So. <laughs> you know, but the, so, but the goals are different typically at that age, right? I mean, it, like, you know, obviously we always want to get healing, but if you got a 75-year-old who has failed conservative treatment or they have an acute tear and they're really debilitated, you know, honestly, I don't think that healing is as important. And the, score, the points are still lower for them than the other factors. So yes, it's a factor, but it's not the largest factor. And it doesn't stop you from trying to make them better functionally. And pain. I mean, a lot of these patients, right. low demand. I mean, is the bursectomy and debris, is that doing their pain relief, you know? Yeah, so, so do you all have an age cutoff where we're not going to repair and you're just going to do bursectomy and biceps and, 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 and whatnot? Or, or, or is that not relevant? Awesome. Your turn. What's the age cutoff? <laughs> yeah. I honestly I believe more in the physiologic age since like I've done this transition from Mayo to here to Boston from Minnesota to Boston I had a large like uh, the, the majority of patients with massive tear came when they were younger but I have patients who are 65 and 70 farmers from Minnesota they are amazing right they lift they lift cows and cut trees and I have a patient who come 45 years old and they're barely behind their desk they don't want to do anything so I really think the physiologic age is very important and uh, in this article, they talk about the level of, uh, of activities. It's very interesting because we always say the higher level of activities, we need to do more for you to get you back. And it, apparently it's a negative factor because apparently it causes more tear. But I really think the physiologic age is extremely important because even in, when you go to Europe and you saw those bikers, they are 75 years old and they're biking uh, 10 hours per day and they're so fit. This one, I cannot say they are above 70. I cannot repair the rotator cuff if they fell and they tore the rotator cuff. Be interesting to ask older patients if I could give you pain relief and not a healed cuff, would you take that? You know, yeah, yeah, no, that's well, great. okay, if you say that, they're not gonna be happy, but I mean, if we got you can't tell them that because it's hard for them. You, you, say, <laughs> you say it more subtly, you say, you know, the most what, what I can most predictably give you is pain relief. You may not have all the strength you want, which you're saying they're not going to heal, but we can pretty reliably get you pain relief. Yeah, no, I, mean, that's I honestly it was just like I want to say the age, like of course, except we went above eighty, like the age should not be a factor if the patient is physiologically is fit, is healthy. So this is what I feel. I feel the age is just a number if the patient is really super active and they're healthy. 
So Boston, predicting then your, your ability to get a rotator cuff to heal, what, what are the most important factors for you? Well, if we're talking about factors like from rotator cuff perspective, I really, and this is not mentioned specifically in the paper, the size of the rotator cuff remaining. This is something that we not, did not talk specifically about it in this paper. And this is what Mayer talked about. And I believe in it fully. If the length of the remaining rotator cuff is really significantly shortened, like let's say less than one centimeter for the supra spinatus and Gautelier, advanced Gautelier classes, these are the two factors for me that predict irreparability. Right, so you're talking about the tendon, yeah, the tendon length and then the muscle muscle function. So the ability to actually get to heal enough tissue to get to heal. And then the exactly, function. exactly. Interesting. And then, um, you know, I, Bassam, I know you interoperatively don't necessarily you make the decision, you, you make it preoperatively about repairability. So, um, Pat or, or Anand, uh, Anan, are there, are there any role, times where you are, are going in interoperatively and having sort of a couple things on the table and making the decisions on what you're actually seeing and feeling? Or is this a preoperative decision about um, um, what, what you're going to do once you, once, you, once you take it back? I mean, I think I pretty much have the plan. I mean, I, if I know I need to augment with something, whether it's graft or biologics, I usually have that ready to go. I'm not making a lot of changes interop. Pat, what do you think? I would, what I do is I make the decision arthroplasty versus arthroscopy preoperative. Let's take tendon transfer out because that's, that's a separate discussion to me and we'll get into that later. So if I make the decision, I'm going to go joint preservation with arthroscopy then I decide what I'm gonna have available based on their age, activity level, and chance of healing. So as a general rule, if they're older than 70, and I'll just say, we'll take out just generally, there may be some exceptions. I'm gonna to try to repair everything I can. And if I can't, I'll go partial because I'm okay with their function being lower at their age. I think it's less important. If they're younger, then I start thinking about, okay, is it repairable? then if it's repairable, do they have a low chance of healing? I'm going to augment. If it's not repairable, then I'm going to do something else. In the past, that was a SCR. Now I'm doing a, a different procedure we can talk about when we get to SCR, which is a cable reconstruction. Wonderful. Awesome. Um, any, anything else uh, we have to add before we go to the next article about um, idea of irreparability? Or actually, uh, Clifton, I think there's a question. Yeah, we have a question. Uh, this is from Ivan. Um, in which situations would you consider performing releases for a significant retracted cuff, i.e. to the glenoid to attempt to repair it back to the footprint? Great question, Ivan. Thank you. As you talk about the inferior and anterior posterior releases, um, uh, Anand, maybe do you want to start and then, and then, and then we'll go down the line. What's your, um, what's your approach? I think if you have a massive retracted tear, you need to know beforehand that you're going to what releases you're gonna plan on doing, whether it's the interval, undersurface capsule release, your bursal releases. Um, I don't usually do a posterior interval release. I can't remember the last time I did that, but uh, I'd rather do a partial repair or, um, and leave the infra intact rather than you know slice it up. Bossom or, or Pat, do you have a thought? Well, uh, for me, I mentioned that like, again in the pre, uh, I will try, definitely try to do all these releases possible to try to do a partial repair if I could. And I meant that we're going to talk about it in a bit with tendon transfer if need to be. But again, again, if the length of the tendon is short and it's very, so I will not go the offer to just push it all the way just to try to put it on the, super, the, on the, uh, on the footprint. I've seen patients with pain. I've seen patients with uh, more uh, worsening uh, situation and I've seen them tearing after surgery. So if the length of the tendon is adequate, I will try to do all releases possible to do either partial or full tear, uh, repair if I could. And if not, we'll augment it. I'll, I mean, I can answer Ivan's question that whatever you do, the, the repair has to be tension free. I mean, that's the number one, you know, number one kind of caveat. Three. Awesome. So, so just one, one more thing, like biomechanically, sometimes if let's say, I know this is like, if you have a biceps rupture and the biceps muscle, you have tendon tear and you, you hyperflex the elbow and you repair it and you start to tension it, the muscle fibers of the biceps are different than the rotator cuff. The innervation are different than the rotator cuff. So when, when we assume, okay, maybe they will stretch over time or something like this, I think this is only theoretical because the type of muscle impendation is completely different. And this is where what Anand mentioned is very important about the tension of free repair. Awesome, perfect, and uh, amazing. Thank you all. Uh, Chris, you wanna do the next one? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I'll be brief with this so we could get some good discussion. The title of this uh, paper is Clinical and Structural Outcomes 20 Years After a Pair of Massive Rotator Cuff Tears. So this is a study that looked at the clinical and structural outcomes at 20 years follow-up after massive rotator cuff tears. They say that short and midterm outcomes were all well documented, but long-term outcomes were less well studied. The hypothesis of the study was that at 20 years, deterioration of the shoulder would have occurred and led to a substantial number of reoperations. The authors retrospectively recalled 127 patients operate for massive rotator cuff tears in 1994 at six different centers. At 20 year follow up, 26 patients died. Makes me wonder what they're doing for their rotator cuffs. 35 year olds were lost for follow up, and 10.2% had been reoperated. 49 patients consented to standard radiographic evaluation for ass assessment of osteoarthritis. 36 patients underwent magnetic uh, resonance imaging and allowing assessment for tendon healing, atrophy, fatty infiltration, and cuff muscles. Patient report outcomes were significantly improved at 20 years. Retailers were found at 47% of the cases. 70% of patients had property, and patients with more advanced fatty infiltration had worse outcomes. So also authors of this paper conclude that 20 years after a surgical pair of massive rotator cuff tears, the functional scores remain satisfactory and the rate of revision was low. So maybe this could be a question for all three panelists. Can you comment on the results of the study and what is your interpretation of the findings and how can you maximize your repair outcomes? And maybe we could start with uh, uh, Dr. Denard. Well, I think they've shown, as, as others have shown, we've done work on this as well, not, not this length of follow-up, but, but uh, eight-year average, that majority of massive tears can do quite well um, long-term, at least in terms of function, right? Um, the, I think, I don't know that they outlined it well in this study, but the, the thing to keep in mind is that, you know, European authors, they have a very um, tight indication for who they will repair. Um, many centers in Europe would say if you are, um, if you have grade three fat infiltration, that that is not repairable and they're typically excluded from these, these cases. Um, so we should keep that in mind when we're interpreting these results. So probably it means that patients with massive tears, but low degrees of fat infiltration have generally good outcomes long-term. Um, Yes, I, I just, uh, as, as Pat mentioned, uh, in Europe, like in this paper, they did not specify specifically what was done. Like you have a repair of the massive rotator cuff tear at this time, but there are a lot of authors in France, they do bicep tenotomy only and some partial repair or some repair, and there's no specificity about it. The outcome is very interesting because it, it, it means regardless of what was done, they still have satisfactory outcome even after 20 years, whether it was like really partial repair, full repair, two double row, single row, uh, bicep tenotomy without, you know, you know what I mean? So it's very, very interesting that it, it seems like from more than one study, some of them are shorter term and some of them are longer. They're showing that you do some kind of repair for the rotator cuff. You're gonna have still satisfactory outcome even after long term. So, and this is, this is in, many, in many series. So this is what for me, I feel like this is exactly what's our, our problem. Even right now, we're gonna discuss now about tendon transfer, about SCR is exactly, we're gonna be at that point you have certain rotator cuff, massive, what you're gonna do for them, what's gonna be the long-term outcome. And it seems in certain category, whatever you do, you're gonna have satisfactory outcome after long-term. So, okay, so on that, Basim, so Pat mentioned, um, uh, you know, pre-op selection potentially plays into some of these great results at, at 20 years. Um, so what are your what are your thoughts on, on let's say we're, we're dealing with just repairing these massive cuff tears, what, 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 what are your keys to, to getting the best possible long-term outcomes? When, when you well, we spoke some, like we talked already some about it. And again, this is now what become, we have the controversy, we're gonna have a lot of discussion. So like when we talk about factors, patient age, level of activities, the bone quality, the type of the rotator cuff tear, the size of the tear, the, the fatty atrophy, all these factors will key into consideration. Technically now we, are, we, get to, we get to the next level. So the age of the patient, whether they have arthritis or not, and all these factors are satisfactory. Now you have to do an adequate repair, cleaning, releases, tension-free repair, single or double row. And for me, definitely augmenting it with more if it's not, it's only partial, like partial, if you'll be able to, to augment it to become more satisfactory to restore the force couple specifically in physiologically active patients. Perfect. And then so um, out of all the interoperative things, so the fellows on the call, you, you tell them, all right, the, he, this is what you have. If you're just repairing it, no, no, I mean, you're just repairing it, This is what you have to have. So, you know, you mentioned tension-free repair. You mentioned, um, you know, good tendon quality. What is the technical thing? One of the, one of the two of the more technically important things that you tell a fellow? 
Well, I would say if there is resident on call, I will tell, I will say it's extremely important as long as the surgeon, of course, the surgeon is good because the repairing rotator cuff is to identify appropriately the tendon that you are repairing. Because you've seen, we've seen situation where a, let's say a, a, a layer, you have a, one, not only one layer of a tendon, a double layer, and you have it, it, it is fragmented or segmented and you repair one. Sometimes you repair portion of the scarred, uh, scarred uh, bursa. So the identification of the healthy remaining tendon and specifically to grasp all the tendon and after the, all this principle to release and have tension free to be able to grasp the right tendon to repair it. I think Bossom hits it is that all these tears, you have to understand the morphology. So you have to, as a fellow or a resident, look at the cuff from multiple views before you start repairing. So posterior, lateral, anterolateral, lateral, is it a V shape, U, reverse L, you know, is the cable intact? Is it not intact? And then you know how to attack it versus let's just put anchors in and pass sutures because then you're not going to potentially repair it in the proper configuration. So know what the configuration is, kind of test where things go first. And then I think you've got to maximize the biology, whether that's prepping the tuberosity, whatever anchor you use, um, tension-free double row is probably the best biomechanical, um, but small, medium, probably whatever you do works. So, so Nan, can you talk us, talk the fellows through, uh, so very quickly, you're, you're, you have a massive cuff tear retracted. Um, uh, talk them really quick through uh, the most important steps to, to, to getting the sort of best tension for your repair. So the first thing I'll do is probably do my intra-articular release, make sure I've released the superior capsule, circumferentially release the interval. Then I, and you got to be quick. That's the other thing. On a massive tear, you don't have three hours to fix it. So then you're going to go up top. I, I visualize from lateral and I'll have multiple instrumentation portals. So then I want to release off the distal clavicle, acromion, scapular spine and the interval between the deltoid and the cuff. And I usually work from anterior to posterior and make sure I can mobilize it to its fullest extent. And then I'm gonna see where the cuff mobilizes to and that's where I'm gonna repair it. So I'm not gonna over tension it ever. And I may medialize the repair if I have to. So Bossom or, or Pat, do you guys ever medialize the repair? Take I, I think you can medialize the subscap pretty effectively um, because the line of pole typically tends to be more straight in line, but I don't think you can medialize more than five millimeters in the supraspinatus. I don't typically do it because you start to go over the curve. I would just add this, five, uh, a five's a lot. There's, yeah. there's, a, there's a study done, it's in fact, at the time, Sean O'Driscoll was part of it, I think. And they, 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 biomechanically, I'm saying at least, and yeah. they, they uh, reported that up to 10 millimeter of medialization will be still appropriate without affecting significantly or change significantly the biomechanics of the shoulder. But I agree with you. I don't think, I think clinically, I don't medialize more than five millimeter. I would add to what was said, if you really want to have a high chance of repairing many of these massive tears, you need to make sure the sub gap is repaired first. So, you know, I, I, I don't think anybody was, and we were just talking about superior cuff, but if there's a subscap involvement, you got to get in and address that first, because by doing that, you're going to pull the subscap over. And if you leave the common tissue intact, which is that anterior cable, you're really going to have a higher chance of repairing your supra. If you're looking you know, at the literature, you should see those on the big tears, you know, 30% of all cuff tears, but big tears, perhaps 50% in some studies. We had a previous journal club where Dr. Sava said that he's, he always does an inferior capsule release first to bring the humeral head down for massive rotator cuff tears because he feels that that gives him a tension-free repair more often. Does anyone on the panel do that? Because that, that was a pretty cool technique that he mentioned last time. I, I do it. I do it. And honestly, I have to give credit to, uh, to Buddy. Like uh, in patients, especially with proximal migration, to be honest with you, what I noticed that more with anterior superior rotator cuff rather than posterior superior. With anterior superior, a lot of patients develop posterior capsular tightness because when they limit internal, like because of the loss of subscap, they tend to have slight uh, dynamic subluxation, they lose internal rotation. So they have the tight posterior capsule and inferior. And if you do just, I feel it's very, very important in this case to re release the posterior inferior capsule to push the head back and do the repair. Ivan's some heavy hitters today. Thank you for the continued questions. What is the maximal amount of arm abduction do you accept to reduce a retracted superior cuff to the footprint? That's a good question. Good one. Zero. 
<laughs> yeah, uh, Pat Bossom, is there any degree that you that you'll accept where you're you're going to be comfortable leaving the OR if you have to have a certain amount? To- not going to be comfortable. I'm not going to be comfortable. I don't alter abduction to get a repair. I typically repair them in about 20 or 30 degrees of abduction, but I don't alter that to obtain my repair. Uh, like, and I'm not very sure. Like, technically, it will be best sometime. Like if, if, if I ever do it, I will do it, but I put the shoulder back and I take a look at the repair to see it. Not, but I will not rely on it as a way to, to allow the tendon to heal in this position. You know, what's, what's interesting that when Gerber presented this, re, these results a few years ago, he had in the paper or in the, when he presented um, talk of putting people in an abduction sling and found that those patients did better. But I don't see that in this paper. Did I just miss it or? I didn't see it either. What you're talking yeah, about. but he, he presented that. I don't remember the, the, the exact numbers, but the patients who were in abduction pillow, like up 60 degrees, actually had improved. I, don't remember, I think it was improved constant scores. I don't think it was healing. I think it was improved constant scores. That brings us actually to Ivan's another question, which is postoperatively, do you routinely use abduction sling or regular valpo sling? Maybe you could comment on your postoperative protocol for your massive cuff repairs. I, I use routinely single with a pillow, like an ultra sling. I, I feel that if they have, again, again, you repair them this way, but there's any chance they're going to mess it up. You can slide. First of all, they're more comfortable in slight abduction. The patient feels better. And second, you maybe, maybe you decrease slightly the chance of, of the injury for, for, for whatever reason. And I put a ultra sling on the hip. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, perfect. How about, uh, Nan, you mentioned something about footprint preparation early on. Um, maybe uh, can you each uh, talk to us about how you, uh, how you uh, get, maximize the footprint preparation prior to repairing it? Uh, you know, I uh, used to be more aggressive. I'm less aggressive now just for anchor stability, but um, I don't know if it's PAP. I use the ring curette. I try not to, some of the burrs when you get on really soft bone can be treacherous, especially if you have trainees working with you and um, you want to maximize your anchor strength and pull out. So I'll use a curette, get it to bleeding bone. But uh, I think using some of these biologic anchors can help in that aspect as well. When I trained with Steve Burkhart, we uh, took cautery and we burned it and then we burned it off. So the charcoal's gone. And his idea was to get to bleeding bone. Um, but, you know, I'm at the point now where I don't touch it with cautery. I barely take off the soft tissue. I try not to take off that top layer um, because we know thermal necrosis based on basic science that is going to affect the healing aspects and actually taking off that top layer of bone is going to be detrimental as well. So I do as little as I can um, in, my, in my bone preparation. Uh, I, I'm the same, uh, Eric. I changed a lot uh, over the past years. Uh, I, I, I don't use a burr except if someone has very good bone. In the revision cases, only shaver. I'll put it on high speed and only very little, barely very little. And sometimes, I don't know, if it, I, I feel philosophically, if you're going to put three or four anchors, you're already be, digging big big hole inside this bone and hopefully you're going to get it to heal. So it's better not to mess up this nice layer or area because some patients have very soft bone and you, you take this layer out, that's it, it become very soft and I feel it's better to save it. There was yeah, a along those lines, that's here. Go ahead. Go ahead, Matt. I was just saying, there was a paper last year compared marrow venting versus not with a higher, you know, healing rate by MR. And when I remember, I do, but you get a little cautious about space for anchors and space for marrow vents too. So, but I think that is a technique that's that's useful. Yeah, my philosophy on that is to, you know, tendon heals to bone, right? So I try to leave the bone as much as I can. So I'll actually put in soft anchors immediately because you can put them in with through smaller holes. And I've found that they have very good pullout, but then I like laterally vented anchors to get that kind of crimson duvet effect. Um, and I feel like that way I, I violate the footprint as little as possible. Most of the anchors out now are vented. So you get that kind of effect laterally. Right. Fantastic. Um, all right. Well, let's go on to let's just stay on time. Let's go on to the next one. Um, so the next one, we're going to start talking about those situations where either you can't uh, 
can can complete repair it or or, or start to consider the augmentation or or even even some salvage procedures. So, um, we we are lucky to, enough to uh, be joined by Pat to um, help to lead this study on supercapsular reconstruction using the dermograph. This is one of the the first ones on the dermograph out there after Mahada's um, uh, autograph studies. Uh, this is a multicenter study, irreparable, massive rotator cuff tears. Mean age of 62, 42% um, prior rotator cuff surgery, so a fairly high revision uh, rate in, including this series. General clinical outcomes you can see improved, and um, although the chromium humeral index was improved, it sort of corrected over time. There was a 45% uh, complete uh, graft healing. In general, they graded it as um, a 75% overall success rate, um, but it was 100% success rate if they had complete healing in the graft. And that um, if there were failures, they, they occurred mostly on the tuberosity in, in this study. Um, and then there was an 18% revision rate. So um, table three is helpful but for those getting into supercapsular reconstruction for kind of some tips on improving outcomes, both preoperative selection and, and some interoperative considerations. So a great multicenter study, um, really one of the first ones to introduce. And there's been a sort of an avalanche of studies since this on this topic. Um, if you just go to PubMed, and I did that just 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 before this, you'll see the type in supercapsular reconstruction. You'll see the the explosion of studies that's been uh, happening in the last couple of years. You know, Pat has really kind of pioneered this, and and um, and should be complimented for this. This was a really nice introduction um, for this uh, technique that's used um, primarily or or very routinely in North America. So, Pat, can you expand upon um, what I didn't touch? You know, this is this study obviously was published five years ago patients included well beyond that. Can you talk about both this study as well as kind of now and, and sort of the evolution of, of how you think about this? Sure, I think the first thing, I mean, I think the value of this study was really trying to help define the indications. Um, one of the things, you know, when we started, we were sort of going with this reverse the reverse kind of philosophy, literally. So, um, we, we were quite liberal in who we attempted to do this on. And many of the patients had more advanced rotator cuff arthropathy than a lot of three or even some with four. Um, so we learned from this study that, you know, you really should avoid that in those patients. And particularly you got to pay attention to the subscap as well. Um, you know, though, as I've evolved, I've done, I've done very little of SCR in the last couple of years. Um, because the, the fact is the healing rate is low despite really trying to optimize our technique. And I think I did everything I could do um, from a biomechanical standpoint and rehab standpoint. Um, we still found low healing rates and that's similar to what Peter Millett found in his paper published, I think last the year before last perhaps. In his paper, he sort of said, 80% were intact here, 80% were intact in middle and 80% were intact laterally or immediately. But if you look at it, that means 50% of the, the uh, graphs were intact. So based on that, I've moved away from SCR, um, but uh, I, I think what, what you can still take home is the indication. And I think if nothing else, I, you know, it's a side note, but I think it actually made us better surgeons learning to do this interoperatively and dealing with all the complexity of it. So Lily, briefly before going to the others, can you, um, can you talk about then um, what, what are you doing in, in place of, of, of the SCRs or at least uh, talk about briefly your, your algorithm when, when approaching these, these really? Sure. Hard. Yeah. So I do, now I do a cable reconstruction. Um, you know, Ty Lee and I did a study on this biomechanically and uh, it followed some work that Max Park had done as well. Um, using a semitendinosus allograph. The, really, the idea of that was to try to search for a graph that had a bit better biology. If you talk to Steve Arnofsky about this, he'll tell you that, um, yes, you get cellularization, but you still see evidence of skin within the uh, shoulder years later, like eight years later, literally, uh, from a biopsy on one of Steve Snyder's patients. So he really considers it an implant. And based on the work in an ACL where you have a, a semi-T graft in an intra-articular environment, we thought, well, let's try to change the graft, uh, perhaps get some more mechanical properties and perhaps a little bit more of a spacer effect. Uh, because that was another thing that I learned with Ty when doing some other work is there, that spacer effect, at least biomechanically, is real. So I do a semi-tendinosis allograft in patients who particularly have a supra-infra tear, but they have preserved external rotation. 
Okay, so they still have to have an intact subscap or just upper subscap, but they preserve external rotation. What I mean by that is they have at least 20 to 30 degrees of external rotation. If they do not have external rotation, then I will do a lower trapezius transfer. Very nice. Anand, do you want to talk about um, your, your, your thoughts on SER, on, on uh, options to sort of augment um, when, when you can't or you're not easily getting- Can you guys hear me? Yeah. And on, can you hear us? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. So, I mean, one of the, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about, more about, I think you broke up a little, I want to talk about the, this cable reconstruction. I agree with Pat that in my algorithm now, when I go in with a massive cuff, I don't immediately cut the biceps tendon. If I have a good biceps tendon, I'm going to potentially utilize that as the anterior cable along with an infraspinatus repair. So like Max Park described, if you can repair your infraspinatus, you can bring the long head of the biceps just anterior to that with sutures passed around the infra and to a stabilized biceps to act as an anterior cable. And we've had good results with that. I mean, it may be considered almost an autographed SCR, but uh, in our lab, our results are coming out right now. It's very similar to biomechanically to an allograft SCR. So that's another kind of thing to have in your armamentarium is to um, potentially go from being a biceps killer to a biceps saver. <laughs> We've got another question from the audience. Do you think that grafts typically used in SCRs replicate the native thickness of the superior capsule rotary cuff? And does it matter? Can I add that, with, <laughs> add that question to that? Because the Mahata SCR, correct, is different than the North American SCR yeah. based on thickness, I, I believe. Yeah. Right. And we're talking about almost a spacer thickness, you know, versus one to three millimeters. And I think a lot of people who were started doing SCR years who didn't even know that that was a serious difference between the two techniques. I mean, if you look at the native superior capsule, it's actually pretty close if you take a three millimeter dermal holograph. Right. The question is, is that enough, right? I mean, what really got me onto this is we we did a, the study in Ty's lab where we were taking the biceps, we were cutting it distally, we were rerouting it back up, fixing it at the tuberosity, fixing the tuberosity and going back to the glenoids. We had a box. And what I saw was the head just went right up through. <laughs> and it was like, that did nothing, right? So then, and then when we did the cable reconstruction, I did the cable and we first did a V and the head went up through it. And really when we got the difference in terms of really getting the pressure drop was when we had one of the cable arms straight down. And so after it took me that long to really appreciate the spacer effect, um, at least biomechanically it is real. Now clinically, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know how you, I don't know how you uh, evaluate that. Dr. Dar, we actually have a question about your paper specifically. Was there any risk stratification in the paper for subscap repair healing versus atrophy and SCR healing? Are there other papers that look at a relationship of a healed subscap and SCR? So what we found is that if the patients had atrophy of the subscapularis over grade one, they were less likely to do well from a functional outcome standpoint. We didn't stratify by healing because we didn't have enough MRIs to do that. Uh, others have found variable results. I believe the Rush group found that when you had a subscap torn with SCR, patients did more poorly. Um, uh, Julie Bishop's group, though, found that it didn't. It, it was okay. Um, I believe it makes a difference. If you have an atrophied subscap, um, I think you're going to have less chance of a good result. And so, if I have grade three changes or greater, I will not do a uh, SCR procedure. I, I would advise against it. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and what about uh, um, the role of, of augmentation? So, so repairing it, but then sort of augmenting your repair with, with, with some sort of graft. Um, and on, do you, do you, is there a role in that in your practice? And, and if so, when, when do you make that decision? Sorry, Anand, can you hear me? Yeah, so I usually know beforehand whether I'm gonna use some type of augment. I don't do a bridge. It always has to be repair. I'm going to consider some overlay graft with or without biologics. And, um, but the tissue has to be reparable at that point. Very nice. Very nice. Pat? I go back to rotator cuff healing index for deciding augmentation or not. Um, I think Ivan Wong's paper he just published is really intriguing. 
I mean, he had a high healing rate with a bridging dermal allograft. I believe it was the mid 70s or 80 percent. And his theory was that there's less tension on the graft. And I can see why now looking back, that does actually make sense because when you lock the graft in on the glenoid and on the tuberosity, you're really putting a lot of stress as the head rotates, which is why for us, I think we had our failures on the tuberosity side. Yeah. Bossum, um, before I sort of go beyond this with you, uh, do you have a role for augmentation of your cuff repairs with a graft or with some other mechanism? Not not necessarily a tendon transfer, but some sort of augmentation. Um, and, you and know, uh, Eric, I I had I tried say balloon, my... boss. Let's say balloon. <laughs> yes, balloon for sure. Uh, <laughs> early on in my practice, I tried them, and I don't know, I. I had no success at all with them, uh, Eric. So, and we're gonna talk. I know about the road trap, and after the road trap, I this is my augmentation. This is the way to go uh, in these cases. And then, uh, what about the balloon? Does anybody use the balloon? What's the use of balloon in a? Is there a use of balloon in a repairable or, or a partial cuff? What, what 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 do you guys think? I'm I'm not using it right now, but honestly, I think it might have a role. Uh, it can. It can act like as an internal splint. If you repair the rotator cuff, it may as This is what Laurent Lafosse did for a period of time. Yeah. And Laurent Lafosse is a really very skilled arthroscopist, as all of you know. And when he does the large rotator cuff tear, he uses it as, as like additional to kind of push the head down and protect the rotator cuff. I'm not sure it made difference in his practice, but this could be something for the future uh, from this perspective. Perfect. All right, what is the future? So, so Anand, tell us what's the future of, of, of improving outcomes with these massive, uh, massive repairs with augmentation or balloons, or what is the future that uh, 10 years from now we're all going to be doing? I think we're going to be doing uh, some type of device that helps to augment the kind of control of the humeral head. So it may not be SCR, it may not be balloon, but there's going to have to be a device that is lasting, safe, less mobile, I think, than a balloon that helps us to keep that positioning of the humeral head, whether it works as a splint or as a head depressor like the balloon. I don't think either the SCR, the balloon, are the perfect answer yet. Pat, what, 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 what's your thoughts? So 10 years from now, in development no. to be determined. Uh, gu guide us through. I want to know what he's developing. <laughs> <laughs> 10 years, 15 years, what are we all going to be doing uh, on this journal club? What are, what are we all going to be talking about? I don't know the answer to that. I'm just hoping, I'm just continuing to try to find answers. I think, you know, like I said earlier, trying to have algorithms to take care of the majority of patients in the best manner, right? What do you, what's their chance of healing? Do you augment or not augment? That's first off. And then from there, is there a, you know, is there another technique or device that we can use? I don't know the answer to that yet. Very nice. All right, all right, Boston. So uh, we're gonna transition in, into the, your lower trap study, but before I do this, uh, to kind of bear, uh, go off of this, when when a fellow is starting and they're starting to consider some of these techniques, um, maybe uh, SCR or or maybe it's cable graph that that's describing or augmentation or using the biceps versus doing something like a tendon transfer, kind of what what's your advice on on one them um, deciding um, how to, to kind of parse out the, the, all the different options, and to um, to when they start when they start considering something more. <laughs> okay, uh, Anand, you want to start? <laughs> I mean, can I comment on Bossom's tech for just learning? I mean, he has given us a tremendous amount of experience with this technique. That this technique, along with the reverse, have been the two biggest game changer in my practice in the last 15 years. And I've learned it from him. And the way to, to learn it is you have to spend time learning it. And that's going to the lab, that's going to a cadaver, that's going to watch Bossum or whoever's experienced, because it really is a game changer. Is that a good introduction for you? <laughs> I I will send you the, a, a bottle of wine later. Don't worry. <laughs> but it's true. But it's true. And it's, I think, Bosmo, it's, it's not a technically difficult procedure, especially once you learn the harvest. That's my opinion is once you learn the harvest, the, the, the transfer part is, is, I mean, the grafting part is 
pretty simple. So uh, if I may, uh, if I may say, like for the resident fellows, uh, especially for the, uh, those who are interested in shoulder elbow who are in this in this meeting, uh, it is much easier to be uh, behind the scapula rather than to be in the axilla. If you want to talk about in the transfer of this versus the trapezius. And uh, it may early on, it is really easy, but it may seem easy early on if you only like try to, okay, this is where the trapezius, uh, this is the technique, I can do it. And when you open, it's different because there are still a few steps. Once you get them, the way you look, the way you kind of like look at the area, open and do it like anything else, you will see it become very easy. I'll tell you from our fellows right now, uh, this year, like my fellow have done at least 20 or 30 of these. And usually after the first two or three right now, in fact, we triple team it. Like I will be with the scope, he will be in the back harvesting and someone doing the technique and it takes them around 10 minutes to 15 minutes to harvest. But it takes around two to three times to see it and then you help them with it and then they'll be able to do it. So as, as Alan said, in the lab, if you don't have a mentor and then you, it is better to see it with someone who has an experience with it and, and, and then it will fly. All right, Clifton, do you want to give the summary of that article since we kind of jumped ahead a little bit? Yeah, and also just a, a quick plug for Dr. Alassane. I, I sent him an email every six months asking to come up and observe him. And so, <laughs> I, so this is this is probably my six month uh, reminder that I should do it tonight. So, all right, my so, friend, my friend, the line no, is no, long, but, Chris. The line is long, Chris. No, no, but you should know, I, I jump know, it I with tonight? I, I don't know what's happening with every institution, but the, at MGH is still very strict about the COVID. Like there's still, very, there's no one who whatsoever has been, has been visiting at all. So hopefully it's going to open up very soon. Well, I look forward to it. Okay. So um, this, the next paper obviously is the outcomes of arthroscopically assisted lower trapezius transfer for reconstructive massive irrepar irreparable posterior superior rotator cuff tears. With Dr. Alsan and a questionable senior author in, in Dr. Wagner. Uh, <laughs> Wagner. <laughs> was to report the outcomes of arthroscopically assisted lower trapezius to reconstruct irreparable superior rotator cuff tears. They looked at 41 consecutive patients with irreparable cuff tears who underwent arthroscopically assisted transfer of lower trapezius. Average age of the patient was 52 uh, years. Um, Follow-up was 14 months. 19 patients had pseudoparalysis preoperatively. 66 had a prior failed rotator cuff repair. Surgical technique, which we'll talk about, included positioning the patient in the beach chair position, harvesting the tendon, performing extensive debridement arthroscopically. Any repairable tendon was then repaired. And then an Achilles allograft was then sutured into tuberosity and then passed and sutured into trapezius. So they looked at the standard uh, PROs. 90% of patients had significant improvement in all outcome scores. The presence of subscapularis tear did not affect the outcome. Three patients who had preoperative rotator cuff arthropathy changes of the shoulder had persistent pain and limited range of motion of the shoulder after surgery, and two of them underwent reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Two additional patients had a traumatic rupture of the transfer as a result of the fall, and the authors concluded that the arthroscopic assisted lower trap transfer may lead to good outcome in patients with a massive irreparable posterior superior rotator cuff tear, including patients with uh, pseudoparalysis. Uh, the presence of an associated repairable subscapularis did not affect the outcome. So, Dr. Alsan, maybe uh, the, we were all just hoping that you could just talk about your, your experience, the history of learning your technique, and how it evolved. Well, uh, very quickly, and this is, I've presented so many times before, uh, very early on, uh, we did it uh, for brachial plexus injury. So, in patient with brachial plexus, uh, when I was back at Mayo, we have a very large number, and I was starting my, my practice with them. And every patient, whenever they get elbow, but there's no external rotation, so there's nothing they can keep on rubbing on their belly. And they really want to do something because nobody else has done anything for them except fusion. And went to the lab and it, it, like uh, a short story, uh, long story short, uh, like we felt like the trapezius would be great because the only muscle, in fact, sometimes available for brachial plexus. And especially the lower trapezius as a house look exactly like the scapula, which is the house of the rotator cuff. And this is how it started. Early on, we did uh, we used the tendon graft, but then we realized if we dissect the infraspinatus, you can do direct transfer. You don't need the graft at all. In fact, tomorrow we have one uh, like this, and we have another one arthroscopic. But you can do a direct for brachial plexus because the tendon is not torn. But with tear tendon, this is it. you need to augment it. Uh, over the years, uh, we used to do it open open first, and we publish about it. And now we do it arthroscopic assisted. The Achilles tendon is our way to go. Uh, it's fantastic. Very interesting around the world. Uh, hamstring is in Europe. 
Peronius longus is in Thailand, which was very surprising for me. And there's an area in Brazil, they use uh, the middle third of the Achilles tendon with a piece of bone autograph. So the, every page they're fashioning because oh. of the allograph is not available. I know, I know, but as I'm telling you, like we, <laughs> the graph is not available. People are fashioning autograph from different parts of the body. Yeah. And uh, so far, uh, of course, everything evolved because when you deal with brachial plexus, this is a very, very difficult uh, group of patients. When you evolve it into a massive tear, it becomes slightly easier. And we really have been super happy about the outcome, specifically what Pat mentioned about, about when you don't have an ifraspinatus. These are the patients that they will benefit most from, from this transfer. Perfect. What is the bottom much of the while? So Eric, no, Eric, you're you you're a senior author here. We get to ask you questions now. So question <laughs> from Mike Matschak. This is a powerful technique, but the but I agree that the harvest is the hardest part of suture management. Eric, can you tell us uh, about how you like to harvest the tendon? Oh, I'll leave that to Boston, but the uh, I do think there there's a learning curve. But I think that as Anna mentioned, the the learning curve is is uh, is with the harvest, and then ov obviously with fixing it when you have the big graft in the joint space can be a bit difficult. So fixing it in place and figuring out a very a systematic way of doing it. Um, uh, Boston, what do you think the learning curve is? Uh, I, like is somebody starting out right now in the practice early on, um, how many uh, how many do you think it? it so uh, I would say if someone knows how to do SCR, like doing the allograft passage and, and fixation is a piece of cake because it's, it's really much easier fixation than SCR because you don't go all the way to the glenoid. Uh, but the, just the trapezius harvest is the part that really, really, is really easy, but it requires a little bit of just some pointer to make sure you get it right and that's it. And as I said, if someone uh, did the lab and watched it, I really think they'll be able to do it. I have a number of, of people sending me email. We watched the video, we went to the lab. I did my first one today, it went sm smooth. So I don't think it's very, it's, very it's, a, it's a big curve. I think it's the learning is not, is not difficult, it's quick. It uh, depends what your baseline is, is what you're saying. Right? <laughs> if you do a lot of shoulder, then it's really not that hard, big of a That's true, I'm, we're if talking about shoulder. If you shoulders, course. then there's some challenge. You know, I'll give you some pearls I've learned from Boston just from and every time I ask him about it is mark your mark your incision out in the same position that you're going to harvest it from because it, it'll change. Keep excising this fat, this little bit of fat layer by layer. And that's what we did yesterday. Our fellow does really a nice job. Just push the fat away and keep excising it until you see the fibers go oblique on the medial third of the spine. And then that's the tendon. And then, exactly. uh, and then you can harvest it off, you know, sharply off weasel electric cautery. But I think that that's the key I learned over the last couple of years, that fat pad, that fat you can mistake and, you know, kind of when it's thick as, uh, as the tendon versus like just some superficial fascia. So, so but, that, that subscap question that was up there as well, I think Mike put it in there about, um, and in the paper, there was no relationship with subscap tears, but only 12% of the patients had a subscap tear that was really big. I think most of them are one third tears, right? So can you guys comment on your indication with regard to the subscapularis when you do this? You went with the lower trap? Yes. So uh, to be uh, like, uh, if, if I wanna just roughly think about the number of patients who had a subscap when we did lower trap, I would say around 50%. Uh, it could be a full thickness, upper third, sometimes two third. And uh, just what will the key is very important is just like to uh, I, like identify it, repair it, and do all that, and it, it did not affect really the outcome. Like the important one are the ones who have a full fitness tear, and you have some degree of fatty atrophy. Now we're talking about a different story, yeah. Because I, I do not want to talk about the parachute, which is front and back, because this is uh, everyone's gonna be, be scream at me, but uh, this is a different story. But if you have a reparable subscap, and I think. Uh, I'm not sure what the SCR are the same. Uh, if you have a reparable subscap with the lower trap, it does not affect the outcome. Can I ask Bossum a lower trap question? Yes, of course. So my concern with reverse is that the only cases I worry about instability now are these large men with absolutely no cuff, subscap, supra, infra. What are your thoughts about that as an indication for reverse with lower trap? Well, this is an excellent question. And I get, I get asked this question many times around this. It's a great. The only issue is adding an incision. What I mean is if you want to do your reverse because it's a locked 
constraint implant. And you want to do your lat, which is like, you know, as everyone here on this on this meeting know that it's not, it takes another five, 10 minutes because lat is in front of you, turn it around. And I think you can avoid another decision. Why not in a primary? But in patient, if you feel that, especially if you want to do lat in this situation, may increase your risk of dislocation, you can absolutely do exactly the same. We just have to add another incision and you have to add the graft. That's the only way I do it. This is why I usually leave them either for revision or for patients who need an APC because you can attach, you can take, we, we showed it in the academy, if you yep. remember, you, you can, with the APC, you can attach it directly to the trapezius. So Anand, are you talking function? Or are you talking about a concern of post-operative instability in those patients? Just concerned about post-operative instability. Hmm. Yeah, but, but do you mean like if you add lower trap, it will decrease the instability? Decrease instability, yeah. Because they dislocate anterior, right? Right, anterior lateral. So, just, yeah, especially the ones who have escape, who've had prior surgery, and um, you know, I'm concerned about having their instability. Those are the only ones I ever have concerns about being unstable. This one, this one, I do like this in for anterior. If you're not, if you don't want to have, like, if you're not worried about external rotation, these are the one I do just the proximal latissimus transfer, and they do they do very very well with it. Um, Anand, when do you do a lower trap? What, what's your what's your current indications? Like those other things we've talked about, if you keep your indications pretty tight, you're going to have pretty good results. So, patients who have maintained elevation over ninety. Hamada one, maybe our, you know, very minimal arthrosis, intact subscap, and a lag sign. Those patients do great. So no supra, no infra. Um, they do really, and no, and no significant stiffness also. You can do a concomitant release, but uh, the ones that are really home run, if you're starting out doing these lower traps, that's the patient you want to choose. But if you, you know, that patient I would say is actually rare in my practice with a lot of shoulders. And I think if you look at who was indicated in this paper, there's patients, the maximum preoperative external rotation is 45 degrees. So I, if, if I'm interpreting that right, Eric and Boston were using this for patients who have an irreparable cuff tear. Even if they have preserved external rotation, they'll use it for getting the external rotation, but also for the spacer effect. If I'm hearing that right, is that correct? Yeah, but it's not, no, this is not the primary uh, indication. Like uh, what Anna mentioned is exactly the massive posterior superrotator cuff tear with ER lag, and they don't have infra no supra, and they have limited range of motion. These are the best patient indication for lower trap. If they have no teres minor with pseudo paralysis, they still do well, but functionally not strength, which means you can get them flexion, you can get them external rotation, but not strong. But if they have teres minor, even though they have an ER lag and weakness and massive tear with complete fatty atrophy, these are the home run, what I'm talking about. And in addition, some patients will use it now because when they come easy to use it and you become very familiar, it takes you, it doesn't take time. I use it as an augmentation as well. So do you, have you ever, like, can you get a comment on how you restore strength or the best of your ability? Because I have done this procedure. I think it works great. I've had trouble re uh, restoring external rotation strength for my construction workers or. Yeah, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will answer your question. I just want to answer a question very quickly. I see it here. They're talking, have you tried considered leaving a square calcaneal bone uh, block attached to the Achilles allograph? This is a very good question, by the way. We do in cases with a fracture, with a missed tuberosity, and the, the patient comes later and now they have limitation of ER and they have defect at the level of tuberosity. These are the best patient for the lower trap with this piece of bone. And we've done a number of these already. These are the best indication. Now for this one, uh, this is great Chris, because I tried to figure it out. Now we were able to restore it for patient with brachial plexus with some strength, but remember the brachial plexus have no deltoid, no, nothing, no subscap. So nothing resisting this lower trap. Now in patient with massive rotator cuff tear, if you think about it biomechanically, you have the subscap in the front, you have supra infra teres minor. The supra infra teres minor together, they are very, very powerful. Now we are using only the lower trap to restore the force couple. The force couple you can restore and get enough function. But if you don't have any teres minor, now we have only one muscle restoring three, including two in, uh, strong external rotator. So in my opinion, without teres minor, you, I don't think you'll be able to restore strength. Because that's it, you can restore function. And you tell, I tell the patient this, 
But if you have infra uh, terrace minor and you transfer it the way we described and you transfer it almost to the supraspinatus footprint, then you can restore strength in external rotation and some even in elevation. In fact, today I have a video of a patient who came. She's uh, five months and you can see it from the back. Very interesting because of how you put the tendon attach it. I try to do the job test on her and you can see you can see it visually how the lower trap with the tendon go into the supra. As you resist it, you see the muscle pulling against you. So it, do, it, does, it does work very well, specifically if you have some teres minor uh, to get your strength. Otherwise it will be a functional restoration, not strength restoration. So boss, one last uh, question before we wrap things up. So Mike Achak mentioned, uh, is there an age limit? So, so whether it's age or any other factors, maybe outside of arthritis, what are the people that you don't think are going to do well with this? A patient, now this is, and I will go back to Pat Denard's question, because if a patient has subscap tear and coming with an escape, these are the patients they know very well. These are the patients, this is completely different discussion. We're not going to talk about it right now. Different story. Patient who, uh, the age is again, the physiologic age because all the patient, when you immobilize them, they get stiff. They don't get the best out of it. So I think the physiologic age is very important. Arthritis is very important. The presence of an escape is very important. These are the factors. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so I, th I think we will, we'll wrap things up. I guess uh, Ivan, you do you wanna ask Ivan's last question and then, and then we'll wrap things up? Yeah, so uh, Eric, Eric, there is one by uh, Ivan here, another question. Uh, they say, they talk about the age limit, we talk about it. When you do the pulver taft weave, uh, your allograft to the trap, do any of these patients complain of feeling of adhesions around the weave? This is a very good question. Uh, we've done, I do not know the number of patients right now between here and overseas. I had only one patient, not from the pulver taft, but he had sensitivity over the scar. But I haven't had any patient, even you can see, I honestly can, wish I can show you. You can see sometimes if they're skinny, you can almost see the tendon exactly what it is, but they have no issue with it at all. So this area is not that sensitive. Remember, that doesn't have too much sensation going to it. So luckily we don't end up having issue with it. Yeah, yeah we got um, maybe to, to tie this all together. I want to make sure that Augustine gets his question answered and it's a good way to wrap it up. So for the panelists, he wants to know what each of you would do in this situation. A 50-year-old male, massive retracted tears, significant muscle atrophy, including subscapularis, hemata 2, no arthritis, no pseudoparalysis, but pain and weakness. What would each of the panelists do? I will do a parachute. So basically, it sounds like a, a at least, uh, you know, supra infra. Um, and subscap. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, with, with some where's that unicorn? unicorn? Where's that yeah. unicorn? <laughs> it doesn't have pseudo paralysis. Uh, I, I mean, so maybe let's answer that twice. So, one, the patient you mentioned uh, that's, that's obviously if you have subscap super infra, you probably have some sort of SI epic of super paralysis. And then, two, the second one, you have you have super infra, um, maybe subscap's repairable, um, but you have rel relatively preserved function. So, maybe answer both of those. So, Anand, do you want to start? Uh, I think if the subscap is reparable and I have a massive irreparable posterior cuff, I would probably do a lower trap in that case. Uh, higher, if it was an older patient, if, if it's a patient with all four cuff tendons out with atrophy, then probably reverse. What's your, for both the scenarios, so the first one, irreparable cuff, 50 year old, but active, um, this, uh, including subscap. The second one, repairable subscap, um, intact teres minor, um, re reasonable, but very weak, uh, function. Um, uh, but, but, uh, super infra fatty infiltration. I think the point is what you just said. It really depends on their function. You know, um, I, I like the idea that if they don't have extra rotation, I'm going to go with a lower trap and repair the subscap. If they have that preserved, um, I would probably repair the subscap and do a cable reconstruction. So uh, Eric, for, for this one specifically, the 50 year old, uh, we, we're about to publish about this. The patient with what I call it pan rotator cuff tear, front and back, almost always, uh, and I mentioned that, usually they have teres minor only, and they have fatty supra subcap, and, and, and this patient, they can present in two different ways. They either present with an escape, and this one I tried, I failed. This on reverse shoulder, doesn't matter. They are 50, they are, they, these are with a frank escape, 
I do not know. Up till now, I don't have to meet the reversion because they have atrophy subscap supra infra, but they have teres minor. But there is a category they come exactly like this. They have only teres minor. You can see fatty atrophy and they can raise almost up to horizontal and they don't have escape. These are the patients they will do well with the parachute where you transfer lat anterior and, and uh, lower trap. And I, I really have a very good result with them. So if there is no frank escape, they do well with this technique. If there's frank escape, it's a reverse regardless of the age. Once you've, once you've taken down the CA arch in some type of prior surgery, there's very little other than a reverse that's going to fix that. I agree. I agree. Wonderful. Well, thank you all very much for tuning in. Um, sorry we ran over late. This was an amazing discussion. As as we expected, learned a, amazing, a ton of from you. Um, for the uh, those who are tuning in, we do record all these. They're on the website. Uh, contact me if you have questions about how to find them. I look forward to seeing you all again in a couple of months. Thank you very much for spending your evening with us. Thank you, Alex. Thanks. Good to see everyone. Thanks, um, thanks uh, Pat. This is awesome. Good night.